So my name is Simon Evans. I'm Director of Digital Engineering at Atkins and the SNC Lavelling Group. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about digital twins and what that means. And my background is I'm a chartered engineer and also a technology developer. So I've got a background in the heavy industries, which means oil and gas, mining, nuclear. But also I've got a particular passion, a particular focus on this concept and the transformational applications it can bring to our sector and to industry and society in general. So those of you familiar with Digital Twins probably think, great, not another person that's going to stand on stage, tell me Industry 4.0 is coming, the world's going to be radically amazing, absolutely brilliant, and probably try and sell me a unicorn of some capacity. Now, I agree with you, that's probably what most people do and talk about when they talk about Twins, but I'm going to share with you something a bit fresher today, which hopefully will be a bit of a new slant on how industry works and how industry looks at it. But of course, it's hard not to get excited by this concept when you hear statistics like this from a Markets and Market report, which says the global market for digital twins is going to increase tenfold by 2025. So that's a significant amount of money that's going to be invested in this space over the next six years. Or a Gartner report a few years ago saying that half of all large companies will be using one, whatever a digital twin is, by 2021, resulting in a 10% improvement in effectiveness. Now, I will explain what that means, a twin, in a second, but first of all, who are we? Who are Atkins? So Atkins are a member of the SNC Lavelling Group. We're a Montreal-based engineering and construction company. We have about 50,000 people working across 50 different countries, and we cover a, number, cover a number of different sectors, if you will, from infrastructure all the way through to resources, and operate across a number of service lines. There we go operate across a number of service lines, including digital and AI. So the interesting space here is that we are an engineering company and not a technology company, and we're not trying to be a technology company. So I'll also note that what I'm going to share with you today is particularly focused through the lens of the built environment and the engineering space rather than a technology space. So going back to twins, this is a widely cited quote that many of you have definitely seen before, which it says, if I had asked people what they would have wanted, they would have said faster horses. So this, of course, is Henry Ford talking about how people are transitioning to cars and what that means for them. Now, why I'm starting with this quote before I go on to talk about twins is really this is talking about education and people not really understanding the art of the possible or what they want until they're shown it. Now, of course, many other famous people, Steve Jobs and otherwise, have said quotes similar to this. But I think it asks an interesting question around twins, particularly about how we look at them and how we can engage with them and what they mean to us as an organization. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with twins, I'll explain in the next couple of slides what that means. But those that are have probably seen that the market has been flooded by a lot of people talking about it, selling aspirational pieces about it, and it's very hard to understand. Particularly on the journey of developing a digital twin, most people focus on the unicorn that you will achieve at the end of the journey, rather than the milestones of incremental value you can gain along the route. Now, because of that, Atkins did some thinking and some testing, and we came up with an idea of how to categorize digital twins into a bit of a spectrum as a way of communicating them both internally to your organization but externally as well, which in the context of CIOs is a great way of articulating how exactly you can go about procuring such solutions because you know where you need to fit and what you need to deliver. So I'm first going to unpack what I mean by that, by the idea of a digital twin maturity spectrum. So to explain what a digital twin is, the basic concept is that we have a physical asset and then we have some type of digital representation of the same asset. As you can see from the picture behind me, we've obviously got a photo on one side, then some type of 3D model on the other side. Now these two environments are somehow connected together with data flowing from the physical into the digital, where insights and decisions can be made, then interventions can be flowed back into the physical allowing outcomes to be done in that physical environment and changes to be made. So that cycle and that connectivity is important to the concept of a twin. It's not just a 3D model, for example. There has to be some link between the two environments. Now, as I said at the beginning, we're an engineering company, so what I'm sharing here is through the lens of assets and physical assets rather than an organisational digital twin, for example, or a process digital twin, which of course can exist but are not what I'm going to speak about today. So this is the concept, but when we look at it in reality, what we're actually seeing is, in most cases, there's typically just a one-way flow of information from the physical to the digital. 
through some type of platform or aggregator, or constellation of platforms or aggregators, it doesn't really matter. Now that's great, and in simple cases that could be things like survey information, captured in the physical environment about the asset's condition, flows through some type of platform or workflow, and ends up in a digital environment, and then can be used for insights, feeding back into the physical, as per my previous photo. What we also see is people typically want to connect in data sources into this platform or the constellation of platforms. Now, these data sources can be anything. They could be asset management systems, document management systems. It doesn't really matter, even IoT systems. But what it is is you're connecting in data into this platform that, again, flows through into the digital environment. Now, that makes a lot of sense. That's absolutely great. But what we found is people aren't really talking about what's within that digital segment. It's just that that part of the diagram, but what's actually there? So we did some thinking, and we realized that within that space, there's actually a bit of a, a spectrum of maturity that exists, a number of elements that can be used to define the characteristics or properties of a digital twin. Now, this spectrum is logarithmic in terms of its complexity and connectedness, but it isn't necessarily sequential, which means elements that have a higher order of complexity can exist before a lower order of complexity. So if we look at these elements, we've named them zero to five. Zero being the baseline and the least complex and connected, all the way through to five being the most complex. And as I say, going on that journey towards that unicorn that everyone's trying to understand and to build with their digital twin. So to unpack each one of these in turn, if you were to create a twin of a physical asset, Again, remembering that a twin is just a digital representation of the asset. Rightly or wrongly, most people think that's some type of 3D geometry or 2D map over which you overlay information that's poignant to the objective you're trying to achieve. So, of course, if you have a built asset and you have no information about the spatial environment, the 3D geometry, the first thing you do is go out and get that certainty. Hence why element zero is reality capture. You go out using a variety of devices, it doesn't really matter, point cloud, drones, LIDAR, whatever it is, to capture the physical environment and bring it into your ecosystem. Now with this element, you can already provide significant value to an organisation already, or yourself, or a client you're working with in the context of us as a consultant, providing that certainty about the as-built condition, what's actually physically there, the spatial context and understanding of the environment. Now naturally beyond that, you will evolve and develop your raw information set into some type of 2D map or 3D system. So this is a CAD geometry in reality. But when you evolve that into element one, it's just surfaces, shapes, and solids. There's no intelligence behind it. There's no metadata. There's no BIM data. It's just a dumb model, if you will. Now, this is typically the type of information we get from a design project if we're designing a physical asset and it allows you to do all those things that we currently see around optimization of design and a bit of asset management and coordination as well. Now the really exciting space comes when you move on to element two. This is when you enrich that environment with persistent or static information. By that I mean information that doesn't change at a high frequency. So documents, drawings, photos, or even asset management systems, SAP or Maximo for example. Now this is when you start to be able to answer those what-if questions that a digital twin promises. The 4 or 5D simulation, the design and proper asset management. And this is where most people start to say, hey, I recognise that. That's what I could see as a twin. Now beyond that, into element three, is when you connect it to real-time or near real-time information, IoT or whatever it might be. Now plugging this data from the constellation of technologies or platforms you have through into the digital environment allows you to do all those things like operational effectiveness and remote and immersive operations. Now, of course, as I've gone through to this state, you only develop this proportionally as and when you require based on what you're trying to answer in the context of your organisation. So, for example, you wouldn't develop a fully blown digital twin to answer a simple problem. There'd be no point in that. It wouldn't be cost effective. But you proportionately and incrementally develop it as and when as you go down that journey of incrementally providing value using this concept. Now, of course, beyond that into element four, when you have the two-way integration interaction from the physical into the digital. What I mean by this is if you had a button or a valve in a digital model, you could click it and the physical would physically react. 
Now, of course, we already see this in the rail network. And for those of you in the room next door, Virgin Trains were speaking earlier, and they were talking about some of this. So this already exists, it's, and that's an th important thing to realise. And then beyond that, into element five, the ultimate end state of what we're trying to get to, the complete autonomous asset that can manage and control itself with self-governance. Now, obviously, this is where we want to get to as an industry and as a society. We have to acknowledge that there is a journey in order to get there. Now, a few more clicks, and that's the end of this kind of explanation as such. But the important thing to really consider and to realise, especially in the context of this conference, is around all of those elements is the idea of some type of analytics and simulation engine, which allows you to interrogate and analyse all of the information contained within that stack and provide all of those insights that people talk about and blag about, such as predictive maintenance or reactive decision making. Of course, you can do that at any stage of the elements. It doesn't have to be really advanced. It can happen purely from a raw point cloud, for example, allowing you to answer those what-if questions and intrinsically linked to security, of course. Now, the other piece is that a digital twin will naturally become as valuable to an organisation as the physical asset it represents itself. We're going to start to see these type of things actually recognised on the balance sheet. Should be as important to an organisation and intrinsic in value to that organisation as a HR or finance system is. So it should fit into the digital ecosystem that exists within your organisation and therefore all the complexities that come with that. Now the final piece being that naturally this set of information is quite rich and is not necessary for all people to access all that information at once. The point of what you're trying to do with this type of concept is create a single version of the truth, which is distinctly different as we all know from a single source of the truth which assumes you're going to collaborate or bring everything together into one place, which we know is absolutely not possible. So the idea being that you provide access into the twin and provide the information based on what the person who's observing it is trying to understand. So by that, a planner would see different information to an asset manager, to a scheduler, etc., etc. Now, all this is important, and then when we look at these six elements, aspirationally, people want to get to that top element five. But in reality, what we've seen is most organisations are actually only around these levels, elements 0, 1 and 2. Now, the complexities associated with this are quite a lot, particularly when it comes to managing large volumes of data and what that means for our infrastructure and our networks and how we access that reliably across dispersed organisations, necessarily. But, of course, the really interesting place comes when we look at the element 2 and the element 3, when we start connecting this to other data systems and other sources of information to provide that aggregated view and the benefits that come from it. Now, in the context of the built environment, it's really easy to see how people find this quite exciting, particularly when you hear statistics like this, where 80% of the buildings that we'll be using by 2050 have already been built, which also means that the size of the prize here is not the new asset at all. No one cares about them because that's the minority. It's about how can you do this for the existing asset fleet or the legacy infrastructure and assets, the rail network, the road network, for example, that exist across the UK and across the world. And what can we do to address that challenge? Now, the point of what I've shared there as a categorization tool is really, really, really valuable in the context of when you're trying to establish where you sit with digital twins. It's difficult to benchmark the various suppliers and vendors out there and say, what are you doing? What can you offer? How can I engage with you? When most of them are selling that aspirational unicorn, rather than telling you the incremental steps along the journey. Now, because of that, and through testing this with a number of clients and government, we've put this forward as an idea of how to categorise that, and so far ourselves have found that pretty useful. But one further step I'd like to talk about is particularly around the data aspect itself. So, again, many of you have seen these type of diagrams before. If we imagine a continuum of visibility to interoperability of data, at the moment, when we look at a lot of our assets and the clients we represent or the customers we represent, we have huge sets of information that are probably underutilized and underharnessed, and we don't really know how to access them. So we're really at the stage of the journey of visibility, trying to surface that information to provide insights for particular purposes within our organizations. Now, of course, what we really want to do is move down that spectrum towards interoperability, where the data that we have can connect and can be used and can communicate with data sets from other organizations, <coughs> obviously in a secure and trusted way, so that you can mutually benefit from each other. So the example B, I'll use the rail network again. If you're on the rail network, for example, 
how beneficial would it be if the information exchange there could be exchanged with other infrastructure or travel systems so that collectively you know all of that information together can provide insights about blockages or problems or where the crowd congestion is. So that aggregated view is really, really beneficial and moves towards the idea of having a connected ecosystem of digital twins. <coughs> now this is another really important piece and we're speaking at the beginning um, about Cambridge and why particularly that's important is out of Cambridge at the moment there's an organisation called the Centre for Digital Built Britain Government funded, just is based out of there as a location. Now they're on a journey at the moment of creating a national digital twin, which is broadly a digital twin of the entire UK economy, including all physical assets within the built environment, every utility network and every energy network all connected together. Now of course they're not going to own and create that themselves. What they're actually doing is creating the framework and the method of communication so that each of these twins owned by their individual owners can communicate and talk with each other. Now many have talked about this project and I agree with it as being as influential for society today as the conversations happening 30 years ago when Tim Berners-Lee and his team standardised the internet. Now what I mean by that is if you look at the society shift that we've seen over the last 30 years and how radically now those are taking photos and tweeting and even this video going on YouTube is all hosted based on that standardisation what are we going to see as this evolves 30 years down the line? Now, that's a really important piece when it comes to us as organisations, understanding how we can leverage this technology and engage with it at a national level with the intent of plugging into that ecosystem. So what they've come out with so far, they've done a number of things. One of the most influential documents is something called the Gemini Principles, which talks about nine different principles broadly categorised around purpose, trust and but a function, I was going to say, I can't even read the font of my own slide there, which comes with a number of principles around purpose, trust, and function, which is really, really important in framing how we go about developing these in the broader context of built environment and the national ecosystem. So, the key part really is how do we move forward with this? I've shared with you the main thing about categorization, and we've seen that that's hugely important when you're trying to engage with the supply chain, engage with your partners, understanding how you, as an organization, can go and start on your digital twin journey. But what are the six things I'm going to leave you with about how we can move forward with this? The first is embrace the concept now. If you're starting a new project and are not considering a digital twin approach, you should really reconsider. Because otherwise, all we're doing is creating a dumb asset for the future, and that's not helpful for anyone. We should be actively engaging this in the beginning. Number two, respect the journey. This is a journey, a multi-year, a multi-generational journey. So why worry about that aspirational unicorn at the end? Instead, worry about the first adjacent step, obviously with the end in mind, but what can I do to get that incremental value along the journey? What does my business need to get that incremental value along the journey? How can I support that? And the framework I presented earlier is a great way of doing so. Collaborate. Of course, here, collaboration only comes from having everyone involved in the conversation. As we know, digital, which has become a bit of a dirty word, is also semi-egotistical, which means individuals think that they can drive success for the whole nation or their company on their own <coughs> steam. Of course, it's not like that at all. As you've heard through many of the speakers today, it's about pairing with the business, pairing with people in your organisation to make sure that collectively and together you can win and collaborate. Third, regulate. I talked about the government-funded project already. It's important in regulated industries or within your industries to help work with government and those organisations who are helping to standardise and regulate this because without having those standards in place you can never scale, as we all know. And of course silos. I've come from the built environment space. I know many of you from your name tags represent different sectors. All of us are on this journey and all of us need to get together and learn from each other, which is really important. And finally, the sustainable piece. This type of approach will allow us to be sustainable in our approach for long-term society gain and we should bear that in mind, particularly with things like the UN Sustainability Development Goals. So that's the final piece I wanted to share. Uh, come in just around time, even with that microphone glitching out. Um, the one thing I'd like to say is that we've put out a white paper in association with the Institution of Engineering and Technology on this. Uh, you can download it from the link there or just Google IET or Atkins and Digital Twins. And there's a lot of content in there around what I've just shared, but some more examples of how we're using it in the built environment. So thank you very much for listening, um, and I'd like to take any questions.